Google's AlphaGo shocked the world by defeating Go legend Lee Sedol yesterday. This upset wasn't a fluke. The AI program developed by Google's DeepMind unit has just won the second game of a five-game Go match. But now what we're seeing is that for the first time, computers can see as well as humans. That's pretty incredible. If you combine that with the ability to have arm-like manipulation, uh, then they can make us far more productive, but then you know, the job market has to adjust to that. I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. The development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Hey there guys, I've got a theory. The first super intelligence will be a human machine hybrid. So on this channel, I'm interested in anything that can potentially improve human performance. So that includes all the stuff you can do right now. So that's fitness training, brain training, nootropics, etc., productivity tips. It also includes transhumanism, potential future technologies that could someday create genuine superhumans. I find that completely fascinating. I don't know why anyone wouldn't. So with that in mind, I read occasional science fiction and a very popular topic in science fiction is something called the singularity. It's also a popular topic in science in general. So the singularity is a point in the future at which the uh, rate of technological acceleration is going to become self-sustaining. It's going to gain so much momentum that we're having all these breakthroughs and it's each breakthrough is leading to more breakthroughs and just the world is changing at such an incredible rate that we can't even imagine it, you know, as in Thor, the line between technology and magic has become blurred. It's often suggested that this will be the result of an artificial intelligence, an AI, uh, that will basically be able to solve all our problems for us. So we create an intelligence, a computer program, that intelligence becomes so intelligent that it's able to make all these scientific breakthroughs, even improve its own artificial intelligence. This accelerates at an increasing rate and the world completely changes. This is the futuristic utopia that many a scientist dreams of, but also many people are obviously quite scared of because it could result in a Terminator or Matrix type scenario. But the argument I'm making is that this isn't gonna happen. We might reach the singularity, but it won't be an artificial intelligence, in my opinion, that is responsible. I think something much more interesting will be responsible, a topic that you hear about a lot less interesting and that is probably just around the corner, arguably even here right now, that's an exocortex. So this is something a bit different. I don't always talk about these kind of topics on the channel, but I made a video on uh, working memory recently and something on virtual reality and brain training just to test the waters to see if you guys like this kind of content. And although they've got fewer views, they did get a lot of engagement and people responding and chipping in. So I thought I'd do another one similar. Let me know in the comments below if you find this interesting or if you'd like me to stick to bodybuilding and that and uh, shut up about the singularity. Let's start by looking at where artificial intelligence is right now. This is a topic that is very relevant to transhumanism, to self-improvement in the future, and it's certainly something that I think you'll find interesting if you stick with me. So as you know, artificial intelligence is everywhere right now. It's massive news. It's in your phone, it's in your car. You've got self-driving cars, you've got Siri, you've got Google Assistant, you've got all kinds of tools that rely on some amount of artificial intelligence. The enemies in your computer games, their artificial intelligence, but whilst these things are incredible, they're not actually as incredible as someone who wants the singularity to happen might hope. Because these are examples of narrow artificial intelligence or weak AI, sometimes called reactive AI. Basically, these are AIs that respond to our commands or our actions, or they respond to events in the world around them. They can't think, they can't plan, they don't have um, consciousness of any kind. They are literally there to serve one purpose. And it's not even that they can do all kinds of things like a robot, they just perform one purpose. So Google Assistant helps you search for things and handle your phone. The AI in a computer game will respond to your attacks. And all of this is essentially carried out by a kind of flow diagram. So you perform one action and something else happens and the program says, if X and Y happens, then do Z. If A and B happens, then do C. So there's no real thought process, it's not, in some ways it's not an intelligence at all, it's just an illusion of an intelligence. It's really just, like I say, a large 
flowchart that results in some kind of response to your inputs. Without these inputs, it can do nothing. So but this has come on a long way, thanks in part to machine learning. Machine learning is a very interesting topic as well, um, but it's also not a form of intelligence that's going to take over the world or create a supercomputer. I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. Machine learning is essentially data analysis and pattern recognition. So machine learning means you're connecting huge data sets called uh, big data often, that's the buzzword right now. And this data is then used to look for patterns that allows machines to work in smarter ways. So for instance, voice recognition. Machine learning allows voice recognition to work by looking at loads and loads and loads of examples of people talking, giving the response. If it gets a hit, then it reinforces that that particular pattern of sounds means X. If it doesn't get a hit, then it discards it. Likewise, face recognition software works in a similar way. Uh, machine learning can be used to give you suggestions on Spotify, on Amazon. Those are examples of artificial intelligence, though quite rudimentary. So yeah, machine learning also fascinating and certainly will result in breakthroughs in science and technology. Uh, machine learning could very likely be used to diagnose illness, to see signs of cancer and things sooner than a human eye could. And of course, a machine is capable of going through much greater data sets than a human would be, and especially once you use cloud computing to pool the resources of multiple machines into one system. So I'm not saying it's not amazing. I'm not saying it's not going to create lots of breakthroughs. However, it is not an example of an intelligence that's going to change the world or go rogue or do any of the things that happen that are cool in films about robots. So then a slightly more interesting type of intelligence is something called general AI. And general AI is essentially the kind of intelligence that is designed to replace the intelligence of a human. So this is the intelligence that's seen in the TV series Humans um, before they gain consciousness. It's also what you'd ideally like something like Siri to be able to do. Um, it's an intelligence that can pass the Turing test and that can learn to do multiple different things. So if you were to speak to an MSN program that was a general AI and it was a really good one, you wouldn't be able to tell if it was a human or if it was a robot. Um, likewise, a general AI could be used to cook your dinner and then lull your baby to sleep and then give you a massage and then play you at Sonic the Hedgehog. In other words, like I say, it can do everything that a human can do, but it's still potentially a program series of events, still basically a flowchart, no consciousness, it's not alive. It's, uh, it's just a much better version of AI than we have right now. So the best example of a general AI that we have right now is DeepMind, owned by Google now. And DeepMind uses a kind of faux neural network to uh, spot patterns, but be able to respond to things in a non-pre-programmed way uh, and learn in a similar manner to a human. It's got a kind of basic short-term memory and essentially, in theory, it should be able to answer your questions and try and pass the Turing test, although you probably will be able to spot the difference. And it can also answer a range of different questions and potentially learn different things. It's been used in um, medicine, etc. So it's pretty cool, but it's still a long way off of being, you know, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator 2. So how does consciousness arise? How do you get a living mind? Well, that's the problem, we don't know. We don't have a model for how consciousness works in the human brain, and thus how can we possibly make something that works like that in a computer? These learning um, algorithms, they use a system that's similar to behavioral psychology. Behavioral psychology says that we learned everything through trial and error and positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So the idea is that you start off as a blank, blank slate and you learn everything that is to be you via interactions with the world. So you learn as an infant that you can reach for something, your mum will pass it to you. This is the basis for communication. And then you might learn that if you lean too far to the left, you fall over and you learn how to stand up. And then you layer these experiences on top of each other to become a fully functional human being. And that's how something like Deep Mind would work with its neural networks and its reinforced learning. However, we now know that that isn't all that there is to being human. If you look at cognitive psychology, which is a more modern school of psychology, we know that it's very important that you have an internal model for yourself, that you have an internal dialogue, that you're self-aware. These are the things that it means to be human. And of course, like I say, consciousness, which is a completely unquantifiable um, consideration. So how can you possibly create a computer that's aware of itself and that's able to make free choices? Because to me, my personal interpretation of consciousness is the ability to make an unpredictable choice, um, to be self-aware and not only aware, but able to act on that basis 
from wherever, not from an algorithm, not from a flowchart, but from whatever it is that makes us human. And as we don't know what that is, how can we possibly make an artificial intelligence that will do that? There are people who think I'm wrong and they're much, much smarter than me, much more knowledgeable, and I suspect that they know of technologies that I'm not aware of. So Elon Musk thinks that artificial intelligence is gonna be the downfall of man and it's terribly dangerous. Um, Stephen Hawking also signed a petition saying that AI was very dangerous and that we need regulatory um, regulations in order to make sure it doesn't run away from us and then take over us and enslave us and use us as human batteries, which is unlikely because humans are very inefficient energy sources, as has been pointed out many times in the past. The point is, there might be something I'm not aware of, but based on what we are aware of, it doesn't look like we're anywhere near to um, creating a consciousness. I just wanted to quickly point out that um, artificial intelligence wouldn't have to become sentient for it to pose some kind of threat. Uh, AI and machine learning could be put to malicious ends, they could be used in a uh, propaganda war, they could be used to uh, create financial crashes, etc. And it's these kinds of threats that many expert minds are warning against, not necessarily the idea that we're going to have a Terminator 2 situation on our hands. The only way I can think that you would create a consciousness, and the only theory um, from psychology that I think has any relevance is the idea that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain. That is to say that when you create a human brain or life, consciousness is a kind of byproduct of all the thought processes that goes on. So you don't have to create consciousness, you create an intelligence and it becomes conscious. Of course, that's a cop-out answer. It's just basically we don't know what it is. It just kind of happens. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still try and replicate that and use it as a useful tool for building an intelligence. So we could create a kind of intelligence and then hope that it becomes consciousness. And the way I think we would do that is actually through virtual reality. So to demonstrate how this might work, consider Conway's game called Life. It's called the game of life sometimes, but actually it's just called Life. This actually started life as a board game, um, but it's now been created as multiple computer simulations. So in this game, the idea is that you have a grid and on that grid, you have certain rules that um, each grid will start off with a certain number of cells on it, which are just filled in squares on the grid. If there's a certain number of neighbors to that square, then it dies. If there's a different number of neighbors to an empty square, then a new cell emerges. It's just a basic symbol of, uh, just a basic selection of rules. And on each turn, you kill the cells that need to die based on those rules and you create new ones where there's the correct number of neighbors. But what's interesting about this is over a huge grid and thousands upon thousands of turns, all sorts of strange behaviors start to emerge. There are different kind of organisms that spring to life from these basic rules, things called like floaters and other things, and they move across the board, they reproduce, they fire projectiles, they survive multiple goes, infinite goes, because they've created these optimal shapes, and until they collide with something else, they stay that way. And people have been able to use these same rules in order to create much more complex systems like calculators. And now imagine that you have a literally infinite grid or a near infinite grid uh, taking infinite or near infinite number of turns. Probability alone means that the calculator and possibly far more complex systems would emerge over time and those that survived would stay and would reproduce due to the same laws of evolution that governed our evolution. So in theory, who's to say that this wouldn't eventually create life? I mean, that's very far-fetched, it's very strange, but I mean, I think that's a better way of potentially coming up with a conscious AI than just trying to figure out how to program consciousness, because I don't think it's that simple. Um, and in a much more advanced system, like a proper virtual reality, you could create a far more demanding set of circumstances. You could even simulate our own evolutionary circumstances and then hope that life would emerge. And then what's even more interesting is that you could then reverse engineer the code that represented that life and you could use that reverse engineering to then understand how consciousness does work. And this is actually one of the concepts in Tron 2, which everyone thinks is a goofy, colourful film, but actually that's a pretty deep subject. So I've always liked it. The Daft Punk music is great. And it actually makes sense that you would need a kind of virtual reality in order for life to emerge. If you've seen my video or read my post on embodied cognition, then you'll know that another very popular theory in psychology is that 
our conscious thought requires interaction with the physical world in order to emerge. That is to say that we only understand things because we can relate them back to the context of the reality that we live in. So that sounds incredibly complicated. I suggest you watch that video because I'm going to go over it quickly here. But the point is, um, to summarise, when someone talks to you and tells you a story, we used to think that that would be translated to a kind of language of the brain called mentalese. What we now know is that instead the brain uses visualisation to imagine itself in that context. When someone tells you about themselves walking through the cold woods, you picture yourself in the cold woods. And we only understand maths because we understand numbers from our interactions with the world around us. So as you can see, you need to have an experience with a physical world in order to have an internal monologue and an understanding of what's being said to you without being, if you're a disembodied intelligence, you've got no context, you've got no reason to live, you've got no motivation, evolution can't happen, you can't understand anything that's happening because you've got no basis of reference. But if you're alive, even in a virtual world, then you can start to learn things. And there's companies like Improbable that are working on these highly complex cloud computing powered uh, simulations of reality where such a thing could actually occur. It has the raw processing power and the detail to allow embodied cognition to do its thing in an emergent AI, potentially. <laughs> it's quite a big claim I'm making there, quite an out there theory for a guy who just read a Wired article, but that's what I think and I think it's fairly interesting. And of course, there's the theory that some prominent thinkers have, including, once again, Elon Musk, that we might be living in a virtual reality right now, that we might be the product of such an experiment. And in fact, the argument goes that there are so many possible virtual realities that can emerge from a single actual reality that statistically we're more likely to be in a VR than we are in an actual reality, a base reality, if such a thing even exists. So in other words, if you've got one real universe that can create a million virtual realities, then statistically, we're more likely to be in one of the million virtual realities. That idea about the virtual realities and us being in one was put forward by Nick Bostrom, and the uh, technology that the company Improbable is working on is called Spatial OS, in case you want to do more research and just to quote the correct references. So hopefully you found that all very interesting. I certainly do. Um, but my ultimate conclusion is that we're not going to create a conscious AI capable of bringing about the singularity anytime soon. The best way to do it is certainly a bit of a gamble and a shot in the dark. So what I think is much more likely is that an exocortex will be the first super intelligence and thus the thing to bring about the singularity. So an exocortex is literally an external cortex. It's a piece of machinery that enhances the function of your brain, just like an exosuit gives you extra strength, an exocortex gives you extra brain power, but it's a piece of software and or hardware. It's not something you hear about very often at all, and in fact, the only example I can think of from fiction is the helmet that Charles Xavier wears when he's trying to enhance his telekinetic powers. Someone remind me of the name of that in the comments below if you've watched this far. So the idea is that rather than relying on an artificial intelligence to come up with all these breakthroughs and to increase its own intelligence, we instead upgrade our own minds using technology. We provide the consciousness, it provides the machine learning, and therefore we become geniuses. So is an exocortex possible? Well, obviously we don't know for sure, but we've had a lot of breakthroughs and there's a lot of research and technological development that suggests we're certainly on the right track. Um, we can already interpret what's going on inside the brain by looking at activation of specific neurons and by purposefully uh, stimulating neurons using electrodes, we can create an input to do all sorts of different things. One of the coolest examples of this um, is a piece of research where they managed to recreate what someone was seeing by looking at act activity in their visual cortex. So they showed the participants a video of something and then they watched what was happening in their brain, the uh, occipital lobe, the visual cortex is at the back of the head. And then using that, they created blurry recreations of what they saw on the screen. It was hard to make out, it wasn't perfect by any means. Low spatial and um, temporal resolution, but the point is that you were close to being able to see what these people saw. And using that same technology, in theory, you'd be able to see what people were seeing in their dreams or even in their imagination. So it wouldn't be that hard. Well, I mean, it is hard, but it wouldn't take that many extra steps for us to potentially have a computer that could read what you were thinking and then provide you with the information you needed before you even thought to do it. 
There are also technologies that allow paralyzed patients to move a mouse around the screen. And there's technologies that help to restore people's vision by stimulating um, the visual cortex with electrodes implanted. And thus they have this kind of like Game Boy type vision, much lower resolution, more like Virtual Boy. Um, nerdy joke there. More like Virtual Boy so that they could see you know, the world around them in a very low resolution with these kind of big red pixels. But the point is that eventually you've got an input and an output there. So you could have a computer that does all the processing power, cloud computing, machine learning. You think, man, I need to know the name of that song. And your computer just automatically sends it to your brain. Um, and you could play it in your head. Imagine a virtual reality where you can actually walk around because all of your senses are stimulated just as though it was the real reality. Um, Imagine knowing everything that's on the web as though it was already in your head. Um, imagine being able to spot incredible patterns in the data coming in through your eyes. Imagine being able to store all of your memories, your working memories, your long-term memories, relive them perfectly. Imagine being able to juggle hundreds of numbers in your mind without forgetting any of them, swimming around all this data. I mean, that's possible. It's not too many steps away. I personally think it's a long, long time before people accept having a implant of any sort inserted into their brain so I think this is more like to be a one-way thing where it picks up on information from your brain uh, using a kind of transcranial solution and then provides you with the information uh, in front of you on the screen so that you can just retrieve information, uh, store ideas etc. But I think that the people who would use an implant could potentially think in whole new ways and especially when you combine this with brain plasticity, our brain's ability to adapt and change shape in response to novel stimuli. And we've seen that if you give a monkey a new robotic arm, its brain changes shape in order to deal with that new arm so that it becomes as though it was part of their body always. In other words, your brain will change shape to adapt to the new information coming in and your new way of using it. So my point is, that while an AI is a long way off, we could potentially enhance our intelligence with a kind of exocortex to a massive degree. And this is already precedented. You know, Word, um, any computer program is already a form of exocortex. An abacus was a form of exocortex. A pen and paper is a form of exocortex. Whereas our AIs um, dating back that far, automatas, they're far more rudimentary. The point is that I'm trying to make an exocortex is further along. It's less of a jump than a, you know, omnipotent, uh, omniscient AI. So I think that the first super intelligence will be a human machine hybrid. So yeah, I hope you found that interesting guys. Like I say, really different, really long, um, but I just thought I'd give it a try. I've got all the usual stuff coming here soon, including um, Bruce Lee's diet, uh, how to concentrate and focus more, uh, productivity tips, etc. Explosive workout routines, all the usual stuff. Um, and if you want to see more of this kind of thing too, then I've got more of that as well. So let me know. And uh, thanks so much for watching, so much for subscribing, so much for commenting and following me on social media. I really appreciate it. I'm having a blast with this channel. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in the next one. So thanks again and bye for now.